So now I'm going to ask everyone to put yourself on mute just so that we don't have accidental uh, incursions. Oh, Neil, Since... you <laughs> Now I'm not muted, but you muted me, Amy. <laughs> so anyway, here we are. I'm Neil Dupree of the Diversity Action Team and together with Amy Levy of the YWCA and also Carrie Dre of the YWCA and Amy Flowen of uh, Community Action of Rock and Walworth County. We welcome you. Uh, diversity Action Team and YWC are nonpartisan. Community action is apolitical. So we're glad you could join us for this evening's discussion on uh, keeping our word, the effect of government shutdowns on Native American tribes. If you'd like to be added to our email reminder list, put your email address in the chat room, please. And the four agreements for courageous conversations are. One, stay engaged. Two, experience some amount of discomfort. That's how growth happens. Three, speak your truth. Four, expect and accept non-closure. We're going to do a little bit towards our goal, but not get all the way there today. This conversation will be recorded, is being recorded, and available on YWCA's YouTube channel. Parts of this event may be recorded and used by media outlets if they are here. At the end of the program, 7 p.m., our partner members will give announcements. All other participants are welcome to give announcements in the last half hour of unmoderated discussion. We would like to recognize that we are meeting on the ancestral lands of Native nations. In Wisconsin, there are 11 federally recognized Native American sovereign nations and one seeking to regain federal recognition. We acknowledge these indigenous communities who have stewarded this land through the generations, and we pay respect to their elders, past and present. And Billy Bob is still trying to get his friend Pete online somehow, so we'll trust that that can happen sooner rather than later. And now I'm turning it over to Amy. Thank you, Neil. Um, Billy Bob, just wave your hand if you're able to get Pete in to join us, and I will yield the floor to you so you can do introductions. Um, so we're going to split the, this evening's inter our discussion into three sections. We're going to talk about treaties, um, the impact of shutdowns, and then we'll conclude with reparations. Um, special thank you to Billy Graham, who is responsible for our guests this evening. Um, Dr. Janiel Lubke is joining us and we're so excited that you were able to be flexible with your schedule and to join us this evening. We are so excited to hear from you. Um, with the first section, I'm gonna show a quick video about five minutes on treaties. I will officially introduce our guest and then yield the floor and allow her to add anything to that introduction and to tell us about some of the work that she's doing. All right. So I will share my screen and we'll start with the first video. Well, I think not many people know that treaties were signed. <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> A treaty is fundamentally an agreement between two nations. Treaties are only made between sovereign governments. In fact, the U.S. has made more than 300 treaties with American Indian nations. The United States' existence when it first won the war against Great Britain was very precarious, and many countries around the world did not recognize the United States' sovereignty. So the U.S., as a way to assert that it was a sovereign, it made agreements with Native nations to sort of say to Europe, to Britain, hey, we're sovereign too, we can make these agreements. The idea that treaties somehow gave status or standing or land uh, to indigenous nations is probably the main fallacy that exists. I think that um, 
many people view uh, treaties as special rights for Indians. But they're not rights given to Native nations. They're Native nations, by and large, giving rights to the United States. I think a lot of people lack an understanding that that wherever they live, there's probably a treaty that gives them the right to live there, granted to them by Native nations. A nation uh, relinquished its uh, um, the majority of its land rights, uh, its, its land holdings, its resource holdings, for the right to preserve its way of life. The rights that are reserved are more easily defined by the U.S. courts as property rights, but better defined by our, uh, our traditional and cultural understandings as being relationship rights to the land, the water, and all of the beings that are that we hunt and fish and share, share that world with. It's through treaties that I think we've been able to hold off a lot of forces that would like to see us erased from the continent. I'm trying to think of one treaty that from the perspective of the indigenous nation has been fully upheld and implemented. A lot of people disregard our treaties and say they're a thing of the past. They've been broken. Let's forget about them. They would like to wipe away the treaty history of the United States, but uh, that's simply not how it works. Our United States Constitution recognizes that once a treaty is signed and ratified by the Senate, it becomes the quote, supreme law of the land. What that means is, is that a treaty, it's as much alive as the U.S. Constitution is. Are they living documents? Do they exist and they, do they transcend generations? The answer is absolutely yes. When people question the relevance of treaties and say, I don't think treaties are relevant, I, my response is, then just give us the land back. We're not talking about past history. We're talking about today. The best example of of that is the Dakota Access Pipeline. I think we saw before the world community, the violation of the 1868 and 1851 treaties uh, of the United States with uh, the Lakota Nation um, in Standing Rock. It brought the violation of treaty rights to today. Even though tribes have been experiencing those violations time after time after time, Treaties go both ways. This was a two-way street that it was a shared uh, shared history. It's about mutual respect. Non-Native peoples um, are treaty partners, the descendants of the treaty signers, you could say, on the, on the United States side. I think that the way that we bring everybody into the conversation is we have curriculum that accurately reflects the reality of what an Indian treaty is. That's something we do for the United States Constitution and three branches of government. Why don't we have a tribal component to that education? The ancestors who negotiated the treaties, they were doing their best to protect us, to protect our culture and protect our way of life. And to me, that's a responsibility and a, a way I should, in which I should live my life every day to remember, to honor those ancestors that fought so I could be here today. Treaties are living documents because tribes continue to breathe life into them. We continue to speak their terms. We continue to remember the promises. All right, so as always, I'll put the link for that video in the chat in just a moment. Um, I want to do my best to introduce our very impressive guest for this evening. Dr. Janelle Lukey is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She holds an affiliate appointment for the American Indian Studies Program as a faculty member of the Campus Sexual Violence Research Initiative. She is an enrolled member of Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. She received her BS and MS in nursing from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her PhD at UW-Milwaukee. 
Her research includes health disparities, mental health, substance use, children, families, and reproductive health. So Dr. Janelle, thank you again and welcome. Um, please add anything you would like to your introduction um, and share with us from your perspective the, the importance of honoring treaties with respect to health care. Thanks, Amy. Um, my name is Janelle and I am a nurse researcher. I've been a nurse for gosh, going on just shy 23 years. So I've been a nurse, um, my, you know, my entire adult life. And a lot of the experience that I have is in public health, um, community health, maternal child health, nursing, um, family practice. And um, a number of those years have been working with uh, tribal communities. So um, it's really kind of when I got in an interest in what ended up being my research topic um, of gender-based violence among Indigenous women um, and people. So a lot of the research that I do um, in my position now is trying to get a better understanding of the individual lived experiences of those who are impacted by violence, um, mostly those who identify as Indigenous women. And I really try, um, a lot of my work centers around um, better understanding barriers to help seeking, especially around issues of substance use, mental health, and violence. Um, those are very intersectional topics and a lot of the barriers that people experience when they seek help after experience of experiences of violence um have to do with the way that our our care has is siloed um it's it's not as holistic and collaborative as it could be so a lot of the work that i do is um i do a lot of in-depth interviews one-on-one -on -one interviews with survivors of violence and I listen to their stories and I gather knowledge in the field and try to um, kind of synthesize that knowledge and disseminate it and try to work on policy change and also more trauma-informed and culturally sensitive ways to screen uh, for violence and also the interventions that we have. Um, so that's a lot of what I do and the work, all the work, my work is intersectional with um, sovereign, sovereign issues of sovereignty and, and treaties is that we have people, indigenous people that live on both reservation based lands. And then we have those who also live off reservation and in urban areas and also some people, some tribes like the Ho-Chunk Nation, they don't have reservation boundaries. They um, have all of these scattered plots of trust lands that span over like 15 counties or so in Wisconsin. So um, when it comes to issues of jurisdiction that can become really complex. So up until pretty recently, um, you know, over over a, a period of, you know, a, a few hundred years, our sovereignty has been eroded by different assimilation policies and Supreme Court decisions. Even up until as recent as 1978, when the Oliphant versus Suquamish um, Supreme Court ruling came about that said that tribes don't have the authority to prosecute non-natives for crimes that happen on reservation-based or sovereign lands. And that includes um, domestic violence, rape, um, things of that nature. There's, there's a lot of other um, moving pieces to that, um, other um, policies that that impact that decision, like major 
Crimes Act and, and things like that. But for, for quite a long time, up until, well, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act in 2022 was really, um, that was a, a quite a long period for um, violent crimes to be able to slip through the cracks. Now with major crimes, um, things like, you know, manslaughter, murder, um, severe bodily injury, um, rape, there, there were, there are about 12 or so, um, things that are considered a part of major crimes act. That's when the federal authorities would have jurisdiction on something that happened on tribal lands, but not all of those cases would be prosecuted. There were, there have been a number of studies that have been done that have shown that less than 60% of the time, someone was actually held accountable for a violent crime that happened on a reservation. So the Violence Against Women Act um, was really key to closing some of those loopholes. Um, and it took between 2008 all the way up until 2022 for all these various loopholes to get closed. There were um, there was a number of years between 2018 and 2022 that the the it's called VAWA Violence Against Women Act didn't get reauthorized because there were provisions in there about firearms and law enforcement accountability that um, some of our elected officials didn't agree on. So it just kind of sat stagnant for quite a long time. And we finally, we finally got it passed um, by the, the House and the Senate. So it, it does restore a lot of the lost jurisdiction. Um, unfortunately, we're still not able to completely um, prosecute, um, although it's written that tribes get this jurisdiction back, a lot of tribes don't have the ability to carry out due process. So that would be having the infrastructure to hold um, court and trial. So you'd have to provide a public defender, you'd have to have a jury made up of non-native and native people. Um, you'd have to, um, you know, you'd have to have the, the entire court infrastructure, just like you would a county or, you know, a federal prison or a, a courtroom. So a lot of tribes just, they don't have the funding and the infrastructure to be able to carry this out yet. So, um, so it's, you know, like a lot of other things where you have people, you know, making decisions about things that they might not have the, the lived experience of. So it, while it might sound good on paper, when it comes time to implement it and carry it out, it's like, well, you know, that sounds great, but how are we actually going to do this? So we still are seeing, you know, our women and girls harmed and crimes going, you know, without justice and people not being held accountable. And we see this, you know, the manifestations of this in a lot of different ways. Um, violence, there's a lot of health impacts um, from violence, including homicide, um, which we see, you know, disproportionate amounts of you know, homicide against our women and girls and disproportionate amounts of violence. Um, indigenous women and girls experience the highest rates of domestic violence more than any other racially defined group. And so that's a big reason why, as a nurse, this topic is so important to me because of all of the health implications um, to us and our future generations. Um, you know, not just thinking of the physical violence, but the emotional trauma, the mental health implications. And we know through research that trauma can actually change our our gene expression, our gene expression, and we can pass that trauma in the form of trauma embodiment to our future generations. And I 
I've seen that, you know, personally with the research that I've done in urban areas, um, a lot of the the women that I have interviewed and I've published about it in my dissertation um, were almost 70% of the women that I interviewed had experienced violence during the pregnancy period and many of those women with more than one pregnancy. So um, there are, you know, really severe implications for not only us, but our future generations too. So, um, so that's a little bit of, about the work that I do. It's, it's really complex. It's really intersectional. It could be, I always tell my students, it could be a whole semester class just on that topic because of how, you know, the, the, layers and layers of oppression and um, how intersectional the historical pieces of it are, you know, treaty violations and assimilation termination policies, boarding schools, um, underfunded Indian health care services. Um, we've had, you know, forced um, tubal ligations, forced hysterectomies by our Indian Health Service. We've had our foster care system. So there's a lot of a lot of different layers that really highlight the root causes of this violence um, and why our numbers of missing and murdered um, women are so high and our violence rates are so high. It's it's not something that's new. It's not something that just started happening. It started happening with our earliest colonial contact. So that's what I, I really try to highlight in my work. Um, that that violence goes against our our traditional values. So, thank you for laying that out beautifully and and, and kind of showing us the through line, um, from the intersectionalities that you listed to epigenetics, um, and how critical that is when you're talking about generations of people. Um, do you know if if a if a major crime happens on sovereign lands? And there isn't the infrastructure because of funding um, or, or just capacity to, to, like you said, to facilitate uh, due process of that. Can the tribes request that that be deferred um, to a different jurisdiction or how does, how does that work? Does it just go unprocessed or what can you share with us about Typically that? Typically the BIA um, or FBI would get involved, it would be federal jurisdiction. And a lot of times justice is either met or people are paying attention because of our families and because of our grassroots efforts. Um, a lot of communities have felt the need to take things into their own hands. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of invisibility with our people too, especially in the media, you know, when someone like, you know, Natalie Holloway, her, you know, a, a young blonde goes missing, the whole country is watching and there's, you know, dogs and drones and troops. And um, we have so many of our young women that are currently still missing and you don't read about it in the news, you don't see it. And so a lot of communities have really mobilized um and a lot of our our women our aunties and grandmas and a lot of young people are leading these movements too and it's been really beautiful to see because I don't remember this you know happening 10 15 years ago um with people you know being so outspoken and um we have a lot of indigenous leaders leading MMIW movements and bringing these names out and contacting elected officials and contacting, you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office and demanding that they don't forget about our loved ones. Um, if it's a, if it's a topic that you find interest, interesting, I do have some podcasts and resources for people if you want to learn more about it and and it does uncover unfortunately some of the um bureaucracy and um sometimes cover-ups and mistakes and shady things that are going on um 
but yeah, if anyone is interested, I, I can um, send you a list of that and you can disseminate that out. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, if I may, if I may to uh, Janiel's comment there, um, on, on the Mad River uh, uh, about five years ago, and it's still noted to this day, um, there was a kid and we affectionately called uh, uh, Baby J, a uh, 14-year-old uh, Native American uh, downtown, downtown uh, Mad River, um, was spotted by an Ashland County Sheriff, and the sheriff thought that he was carrying a weapon. Uh, the sheriff shot and killed the 14-year-old in front of 31 people five years ago. And uh, nothing came out of that. The jurisdiction was, well, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. Uh, the uh, years, the years of... Uh, um, uh, of the tra uh, trauma, generational trauma, just ran through the uh, reservation so rampantly. And um, most of the people knew right then and there, nothing was gonna happen about this. The witnesses that were within feet of this kid were never interviewed. They tried to take it up um, outside and went to, um, to the state and then they went to the BIA and it died on its way up the ranks. It's um, it's not an everyday deal, but this is just one example. Yeah, and it not every day, but even one instance is unacceptable. Right. Um, yeah, Billy Bob, thank you for sharing that. Um, Janiel, one thing that you mentioned. I hate that it's necessary, but I love that there is this resistance at the grassroots level that says we will support our community and we will take care of our own and we will fight for our own. Um, so yeah, I hate that it's necessary, but but love to hear that that is happening. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause really quick. I don't want to mo monopolize the conversation. Um, if others in the audience have questions, we're going to follow our normal rules. You can throw a question mark in the chat and I'll know to call on you. If you have a question that you believe is somewhat sensitive in nature, you can type it out and send it to me directly. Um, we'll pose the question to the group, but I will not reveal the author. So I'll give you all a moment um, to do that. If we don't have any questions at this time, we'll shift into part two. Um, so if there are questions, I'll pause and take those. But there are two videos. Um, both of them are four years old. So I definitely want to note that. Um, they were created in response to uh, currently our longest government shutdown and what the impacts on tribe were. Um, so I'll show both of those back to back. One is more general and the second um, speaks to medical implications when shutdowns occur. Um, for people who are living on native sovereign land. Uh, so I'm going to pause. Any questions? All right. And we'll shift and have time for discussion a little bit later. But as we transition into phase two, which is the impact of shutdowns, we'll start with these two videos. The shutdown has also had an impact on services the federal government is obligated to pay to Native Americans under treaty rights. From Wisconsin Public Television, Marissa Wojcik reports from Shawna, Wisconsin, where one tribe is already short more than a million dollars. Certainly we are monitoring this closely. Shannon Holsey is the president of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, located on 22,000 acres in Shawna County, Wisconsin. Her office has been fielding questions from the community. We've gotten calls asking how concerned they should be with regards to the services that are provided. Like any government, community services, including health care, education, public safety, and care for the elderly, are all supported by the tribe. Most tribal nations receive federal funding budgeted through Congress annually. The funds that we received are through trust and treaty responsibilities. They're, they're not aid. And with the government shutdown, these funds are no longer coming into the community. Well, I can say that we're 
starting to feel the impact already. Andrew Miller is the director of the Community Health Clinic. IHS Indian Health Service provides funds to uh, allow us to run this clinic. Um, these are not handouts, if you will. These are our uh, requirement uh, per those treaties. Right now, we serve about 2,800 patients. Uh, of those patients, about one-third are elderly who rely heavily on our services. Even before the shutdown, the tribal nation has been offsetting costs from their own pocket. We uh, started out uh, underfunded. Uh, IHS has estimated that we're only funded about 40% of our, our need uh, to provide medical services to our population. The Stockbridge Muncie community supports more than just its native citizens. As the largest employer in Shawano County, we recognize the overwhelming need of the citizens. We we don't just live on a Native American reservation. We contribute to a broader extent to our community. I try to be friendly to everybody and, and wave. Officer Paige Lehman is non-native. She's cross-deputized as a tribal officer and a Shawano County Sheriff deputy. We basically patrol um, two different areas of the whole Shawano County. I think for a long time we actually had, you know, a Shawano patch on one side and a stock bridge on the other. But. Even though she serves all of Shawano County, she's employed by the tribe. We're hoping that it never has to get to the point where you're having, going to have to furlough people. I like working here and I hope that I never have to leave for something like that, but we never know. A shutdown that leaves tribal nations severely shorted on the U.S. government's obligations hatched long ago in treaty agreements. We gave up a great deal. A lot was lost in that. You give up a great deal. It's not just land. We're caught up in this unrelated D.C. politics over a border wall. The president and Congress need to really immediately reopen the government. We're talking about human capital. We're talking about people and the effect that it has on their lives. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Marissa Wojcik in Shawano, Wisconsin. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman as we continue to look at the devastating impact of the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. Now turning to Native America, communities feeling its effects at a disproportionate rate. Native Americans reporting shortages of medicine as the Indian Health Service goes understaffed while a federally funded food delivery program to Indian reservations has halted. In a recent letter sent to President Trump, a coalition of Native groups wrote, on tribal lands, the federal government assumed the responsibility to provide basic governmental services like health care, public safety, and education as a part of its treaty negotiations with tribal nations. The Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Health Service, the primary agencies responsible for providing these services either directly or through compact and contracts with tribal governments, are both currently hamstrung by the shutdown, they wrote. Democratic Congress members hold a hearing Tuesday on the effects of the shutdown on health, education, employment, and Native communities. Aaron Payment, chair of Salt St. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, spoke at the hearing. The shutdown violates the trust responsibility to, uh, uh, to tribal governments and adds to the trail of broken treaties. Federal agencies that provide critical government services to our nations are caught up in unrelated politics over funding for a southern border wall. Meanwhile, our tribal welfare hangs in the balance. No matter who is at fault, the shutdown threatens to abrogate the treaty and trust obligation to tribes. Federal funding that tribes receive is woefully inadequate to begin with, yet is based on the cessation of 500 million acres of land that American Indian tribes ceded to the federal government. My tribe and four other tribes in Michigan in the 1836 Treaty of Washington ceded 14 million acres of land in exchange for our rights to hunt and gather and fish and health, education, and social welfare into perpetuity. Tribes prepaid in full for our federal funding. Since we cannot foreclose on the land, we expect the federal government to fulfill the treaty and trust responsibility. I'm here to remind the Trump administration that your mortgage payment is due. For more, we go to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Mark Trahan, editor of Indian Country Today, member of the Shoshone Bannock tribes. Mark, describe what's happening as a result of the shutdown to Indian Country. It really is uh, across the country, a uh, pretty significant, devastating impact. And health would be a great one where people are worried about access to medicine, access to basic services. The Indian Health Service is still operating, but folks are not being paid. It's getting harder to refer people outside of the system. What One uh, stat that most people don't know is that 60% of the Indian Health System 
is actually run by tribes or nonprofit organizations, not the federal government. So to have those organizations have to basically bail out the federal government is really extraordinary. Talk about the number of federal workers who are Native American or the number of Native Americans who are federal workers. Uh, most of the employees across the board at the, the Indian Health Service is the largest employer in Indian country, uh, direct employer, over 10,000 uh, people. Um, it's interesting, we mentioned the Coast Guard earlier, but there are actually seven uniform branches of the United States, and three of those branches, the Coast Guard, the uh, NOAA officers, and the Public Health Service are uh, all in different aspects of this shutdown. And in many reservation clinics, it's the Public Health Service that has uh, physicians and dentists and some of the other uh, folks serving uh, tribal members. And what do you think about the fact that the whole shutdown is based on President Trump wanting to build this wall on the southern border? It, it really is crazy, especially when you think that it's not a $5.7 billion project. It's just a down payment. And uh, if this is to go and to end, it's going to be a much longer term because we're really talking about 25 or 30 or $40 billion. And this dispute is not going to go away unless there's a resolution. And that's why I think it's so important that the conversation get broader than just what it is. You know, we just played that clip from the congressional hearing. What difference does it make that we have this first, just this month, two Native American women for the first time have entered Congress? You have Deb Holland from uh, from New Mexico, as well as Sharice Davids um, from Kansas. The significance of this. The significance of that was just striking. For the first time involving a Native community, the leadership of the House Democrats turned to these two Native American Congresswomen, uh, Sharice Davids and Deb Holland, and said, why don't you ask the questions first? And so it started with a frame of, here's what Indian countries think, defined by Indian country. And if you think of the long narrative of this country, that is just a shift in many, many ways. That it's, it's inspiring. That part of the story, I think, is, wow, this is the way it should have been a long time ago. This is Kerry Hawk Lassard, Executive Director of Native American Lifelines, which offers health services in Baltimore and Boston, addressing the hearing on Tuesday. The partial government shutdown is having, high, having dire consequences for American Indian health care, including urban Indian people and urban Indian health. The federal government has an affirmative obligation to provide health care to our people. This trust responsibility stems from treaties and longstanding U.S. policy and jurisprudence. The shutdown of IHS is directly at odds with that obligation. The impact of an IHS shutdown is that already chronically underfunded facilities are forced to make extremely difficult decisions without any other options. Facilities will not be able to provide care to patients. So Mark Trahant, final comment on what you feel people need to understand about how this government shutdown in all aspects, education, food, health, employment, treaty obligations is affecting Native America. It, it's hard to understate how important the role of the federal government is in a tribal community. And you're already dealing with a very poor community in many cases. And to have that money stripped out of a community that circulates, even not just the payroll, but uh, so many other ways, to have that taken away so suddenly. I mean, one of the things that was striking in Chairman Payment's uh, testimony was how poorly planned the shutdown was. During the last shutdown, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and other agencies started talking to tribes early, prepaid a lot of the bills, tried to arrange for things so that there would be a mitigation. This time it just happened. It happened so suddenly because it was uh, after Trump changed course. And that really added to the misery, I think, of what's going on. Uh, Indian Health is a great example because it's already so underfunded. It's the lowest cost health system in the country. And taking resources out of that just makes it worse. Mm. Mark Trahan, thanks so much for being with us, editor of Indian Country Today, member of Shoshone Bannock Tribes. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go to the... So the reason we were looking at those two videos from four years ago, um, fortunately, we haven't had a shutdown in that length um, in the last four years. But as all of us know, that could change in the next few weeks. And so just to recenter us on our topics, we want to look at what happens to Native Americans during times of shutdown um, and how does that impact treaties that in many cases are not being fulfilled um, 
to the letter of the law between this agreement between two sovereign nations. All right, so I'm going to open up the chat. Um, feel free to put a question mark and ask a question. I see that people are putting information in the chat. Janiel, thank you so much for that. Steve, I see there's a question mark there next to your name. Please go ahead and unmute. Uh, yeah, uh, Janiel, my experience in local government is uh, you mentioned policy, setting policy. Um, that policy was kind of one thing and practice was another thing. And to get good policy to be implemented with good practice, you've alluded to, to some of the uh, challenges of that. Um, could you elaborate on that just a little more and what uh, challenges seem deliberate in terms of people not wanting to implement a policy versus what are just not well thought out and well connected and communications issues? Yeah, um, from, for the work that I do, a lot of policy that I refer to are like best practice recommendations um, for providers, not just for nurses, but also domestic violence, shelters, advocacy agencies, and other allied professionals that work with survivors of trauma and violence. Um, the I've had a couple of grant projects that I've worked on um, over the last five years. One of them has been to increase the number of um, Indigenous sexual assault nurse examiners and also Indigenous advocates. Um, because part of part of the issue is that a lot of these problems are really contextual and and complicated and and sometimes survivors feel that they you know they want to be treated by people that look like them and they want to someone to, who can understand their perspectives and if that isn't possible then making sure that we're providing training um culturally specific training and looking at you know, the the institutional policies and ensuring that they're trauma informed. And we run into a lot of issues when people who see um, survivors after harm, if they're thinking with a very carceral lens, like, you know, there are nurses who feel that, you know, justice is an arrest of a perpetrator, but that is not what a lot of survivors want initially, especially those who are living on um, reservation based lands. I'm finding that a lot of people have more of a, they want more of a restorative justice approach to violence. Um, I mean, that's a big piece and why reason why people don't report um, domestic violence or sexual assault, they're still tied to their partner somehow, whether it's child support or um, income, a roof over their heads. Um, so I think the biggest mistake that people make when they work with survivors is they don't respect their autonomy or their, their self-sovereignty. So that inherent right to decide what's best for them, their body and their situation. So I'm finding that just providing education um, to those who provide care to trauma survivors is really important. Um, I mean, even from a personal perspective, I never learned about that in nursing school. We didn't learn about how to work with people who've been harmed. Um, so a lot of, you know, I, I teach as part of being a professor and my nursing students are always, you know, how do I take care of a native person or how do I take care of a rape victim or whatever? And I'm like, you know, they're, they're a human being. First of all, a lot of people want to put them in a box and check off, you know, you do ABC XYZ and that's just not how it is. I think you know, we have a long ways to go as far as, you know, 
infusing this into the curriculum of physicians, nurses, and allied professionals, but very long-winded answer for you is a lot of the policy work that I do are institutional policies, not necessarily, um, you know, bigger systems policies, but I am a, I do co-lead the data subcommittee on the MMIW task force, and we do have quite a number of policy recommendations in that document. I did link it in the chat. That's a preliminary document. We're still working on our final document. Um, we're, we're having community members and survivors read through it to make sure that everything in it is trauma-informed and safe. But um, so I guess that that would be an example of how I as a nurse work to make policy change or implement policies at a couple different levels. So thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for the work that you're doing at policy at multiple levels. Um I, I think that that layering is is where we might see the greatest impact. So really appreciative that that work is being done. Mm -hmm. What what other questions or comments do we have so far? Well, for myself, I um, we all we often use humor a lot in the Native community, and especially with my niece, Miss Janiel there. But I can't express how proud I am of her when she stands there with her eagle feather for the um, health community of Indigenous people here in Wisconsin. Uh, it's an absolute disaster in Milwaukee where most Native Americans live in Wisconsin. Um, the mental health um, is just deplorable. Um, the shutdown was uh, four years ago, but it still has effects on a lot of people um, to this day. As a matter of fact, uh, last, uh, um, last January, um, I was... Uh, I was taken to um, uh, St. Mary's Hospital in Madison um, with a probable uh, heart attack and a couple other things. I was there for about a week and literally, while I still have um, all these things hanging out of my arm, literally was dismissed from that hospital because I had ties with uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and because they provide some health and um and they, so they said that uh, all my, um, uh, the Medicare and then and the, and the uh, Bureau of Health uh, Indian Affairs um, played a role in their decision to release me while I still have these damn things in my arm. Um, to make a long story short, it's now uh, the middle of October, uh, 10 months later, and I still haven't been able to get in to see the heart doctor. So we have, uh, luckily we have people like Janiel that's out there banging away um, because it is uh, uh, different policies. It's, it's not as simple as just making a phone call. Um, we need somebody like her at all times. I didn't know you weren't able to get into a specialist, but now that I know, maybe or pull a few strings. Dr. Amy and I can try to come up with something to help you. Billy Bob's not good about asking for help. I suppose I'm not good at that either, but oh. there's a misconception that indigenous people get free health care in the US. And that is absolutely not true. We don't we don't have free health insurance. Um we do have a, a number of Indian Health Service um, agencies, but there's only one urban Indian Health Service clinic in Wisconsin, and that's in Milwaukee. That's the Gerald Ignace uh, Clinic. And the nearest inpatient Indian Health Service hospital from us here is in Cass Lake, Minnesota. So it's about eight hours from here, from us. So 
Um, so yeah, there, there's not like a blue cross blue shield or group health or whatever health plan that we get. It's, it's not like that at all. Um, a lot of it is, you know, determined by your tribe and some tribes that may have uh, casino generated monies may provide a health plan to their elders or disabled, um, but not all tribes are able to do that. So it really depends on the tribe, but um, most of us who have insurance, it's, it's employer-based um, or uh, qualifying for, you know, badger care or whatever uh, is, is available at that income level. So that's definitely a misconception too. Janelle, thank you for clearing that up. Um, one thing that Billy Bob is really good at, I had the pleasure of speaking with him a couple times today, and he cannot hide in any way, shape, or form how proud he is of you. Oh, thank you. So yes, it is just, it's great to see both of you together on my screen. Um, yes, very nice. So we have a couple more minutes before we shift into our third and final phase of the discussion. But if you have questions or comments, we have time. It can be to anything that Janiel has shared with us, to any of the videos that we have reviewed. Um, coming up next, our final section, we're going to watch a, a video on reparations. Um, because treaties are not being honored, um, there is a discussion about since you're not doing the thing that you said you would do, um, but as we've heard in the previous videos, they, they you can't realistically foreclose on the land that has already been ceded. Um, so what, what could reparations look like? Uh, so that'll be our last and final section. But before we watch our last video clip, are there any other questions or comments or is there any clarification that anyone needs before we move forward? All right, I will share my screen. We'll watch our final clip, which is just over 13 minutes, uh, and then we'll open the floor again for discussion. America began with Christopher Columbus and the first Thanksgiving, except that's not how American history actually started at all. More than 15,000 years before Europeans ever saw this land, millions of native indigenous people were spread out to each corner of this continent. In 1513, Juan Ponce de Leon, made the first contact with Native Americans, setting off land skirmishes that would last hundreds of years. During the 1800s, President Andrew Jackson decided to expand his vision of an Anglo-American country from sea to sea, a manifest destiny. Jackson authorized U.S. troops to go on the attack. They force-marched Natives out west in what we call the Trail of Tears. Over 4,000 Cherokee Indians would die. Congress restricted Native Americans to reservations, but even those lands were invaded. And the attacks would continue even after Native Americans got citizenship. That's right, Native Americans were given citizenship in their own land. After Natives bravely fought in World War II, the government finally decided to pay them back. Most Native Americans received somewhere between a hundred and a thousand dollars per person. But a lot of that money went into a trust and some experts say that that money has not been properly managed. So where does that leave nearly 1,000 tribes of Natives now? There is a spirit in the air here. Here, at the far end of the Trail of Tears, 
there was a promise. My great, great grandmother walked towards that promise, building a new life on new land. Growing up, I never thought of this as anything but home. But as you grow older, you realize our connection to these trees and the grass out here, it was all so much bigger and more meaningful than we thought. It was ours. I'm Principal Chief David Hill, and this is Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. My name is Ty Defoe. I'm from the Oneida and the Ojibwe Tribal Nations. I'm Karina Gould, and we are the original people of this land. Sometimes people don't stop to think that wherever you are in this country, you're on indigenous land. All of the land that we are on now, all of the land that we call America, all of the land that has allowed America to become this wealthy country that it is, was stolen. I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all policy of reparations for Indian tribes in the U.S. They are all unique and individual. Some people call this Colombo Circle. I do not. Oftentimes when people come here, they don't understand what Columbus has done to the native indigenous people. This statue represents murder. It represents rape. It needs to come down. It describes sense of being, and it also gives thanks to all living things with gratitude and humbleness. It's a conversation you're having with the spirit world. Move to New York City to be an artist. People are misinformed about what Native people look like, how Native people are supposed to look. There are Native people on the subways. There are Native people walking down the streets. A genocide of the oppression of indigenous people. A symbol like that is saying, we don't believe you. And now the time for them to say no more. That, that is like Big Brother saying, you do not exist. Our people have fought for generations just to hang on to the land. There's going to be a people that are going to open their eyes and put pressure on the oppressors of North America. With land being stolen, language being wiped away, there was a silencing that was occurring, and it almost is a strategic genocide. But what I think is important now is that our voices are heard. The indigenous people are continuously wiped away. We're at this point right now where people are in the streets asking for the truth of history to be told. Right now, we're in what looks like a parking lot to everyday people. This is the West Berkeley Shell Mound. And Shell Mounds, for our culture, were burial sites. They were cemeteries. Mm -hmm. 
There's lots of different sites, even just in Oakland, that are empty, lots that no one's taking care of. And the dream was to actually use those pieces of land. I, I, we. Folks like us, we don't have a land base. So we're homeless in our own lands and our own territories. The United States government recognizes 574 Indian tribes. Only 300 have reservations, have land base. Mm -hmm. The trust gives us a way to take care of land and to re-engage it in a sovereign kind of way so that we can have ceremonial places so that we can bring culture and song and dance back. I want my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, the seven generations after them, to have what's needed on this land that has sustained us for thousands of years. Breaking moments ago. Key ruling from the Supreme Court today, a victory for Native Americans. I was shocked. I'm still shocked that that actually happened. Finally, when it seemed impossible, a promise had been kept to our people. There's some folks who might think that treaties between Indian tribes and the United States expire. They never expire. I get goosebumps just thinking about that day because that was a day we got to celebrate. Got my minute order, right? Yep, just a minute order and just the one takes today. So, you ready to head over? Okay, so since the Supreme Court ruling has come down, we are receiving numerous new cases. Another one from Tulsa County. Uh, this one is from Muskogee. So we're getting them from all over. I've often said that the series of Indian treaties is like a folding napkin. This is your homeland now. But then a few years later, the napkin gets folded. And the U.S. comes to the tribes and says, you know what? You don't really need all that land. And it goes on and on until there is such little left. But what happened with the Supreme Court in the McGirt case is that the original napkin that was promised to the tribe is now guaranteed again. So this is currently what is the reservation as upheld by the Supreme Court. However, that said, our history is very similar to the Cherokee Nation, to the Choctaw Nation, to the Chickasaw Nation, and to the Seminole Nation. Their treaties are similar. It's not correct when they say half of Oklahoma is now Indian country. Not yet. I really think it's important to note, you own your home still, and our jurisdiction stops um, with Native Americans on the reservation. It hasn't really hit me yet. What's happened this year is part of history. I always consider myself living in two worlds. People still feel that Oklahoma is the land of cowboys and Indians. This is the birthplace of the Creek government when it first started. Our Constitution, Article 17, reads, All treaties shall be the supreme law of the land. And I'm hoping that the Supreme Court made their decision, because hopefully it was based on this. People who doesn't realize that we are here, we are a nation. I am a Skokie Creek by blood, but I'm also 
born Oklahoma. You know, I grew up just not seeing any difference at all. The the picture down there, there's me. I was about three years old, I guess. A lot of Indians and kids, they were died. That's our great, great grandmother that was on the trail of tears. They had a blisters and blisters on them. Where they've been walking in. It was bad, but they made it walking. It's me up there. When I'm here by myself, I look around and see those pictures, and it means a lot to me. But you do not think. We have to protect what we fought so hard to keep. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking. All right. So that was our final video for the evening. We do have time left. There's been a lot of information shared. So we're going to end by opening the discussion back up. If there are any final questions or comments that you want to pose about any of the videos we reviewed, um, or to ask anyone who is here in the meeting, feel free to do that. Again, you can toss a question mark in the chat. If it's at all personal or private in nature, you can just send me a message and I will ask the question without revealing the author. If I may real quick, uh, Amy, I'd like to thank uh, Janiel. I know she's got papers to finish grading tonight and a 10 year old to feed and uh, she jumped in there at the last moment today. Um, we're still trying to get Pete from the back river reservation on the other computer here, but uh, I know she has to leave early, and I just wanted to thank her a lot for for her. Oh, absolutely! I'll be writing her a personal note tomorrow, um, because yeah, we really appreciate the flexibility with her schedule and the expertise that she brought to our discussion tonight. So if you talk to her before my note reaches her, um, please express our thanks and gratitude. Much appreciated. So the case that was discussed um, was the Magritte versus Oklahoma. And if anyone is interested, I'll put a link um, to the Supreme Court filing uh, in the chat. But outside of that, any questions, comments, concerns um, from anything that we covered this evening? All right, well, we may wrap a bit early this evening. Um, oh, Janet, go ahead. I, I This is really appropriate since the movie, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon is circulating everywhere and everybody's talking about it. Um, as I understand it, the, the Indians um, in Oklahoma who were cheated out of all their uh, killed out of all their land, um, ended up in poverty. And um, for them, and for lots of other Native groups, what does reparation really mean to them? I think that's a good question. Um, I, I would imagine that it is similar to any racial group that is owed reparations for the atrocities that this country has committed against a people. Um, it is not justice. Justice, in my opinion, is making you whole. That is not possible. Um, but it is a, an acknowledgement and an accepting of financial responsibility of the harm that was done. And how can those resources be used? Um, Janiel brought up epigenetics, which is, I will simplify it, it is the passing along of trauma. Um, so in my mind, reparations is an opportunity to in some small way make better um, 
from the immeasurable harm that has been done, but it is not justice. It doesn't seem like, oh, that's very much. In, in this time period, it isn't very much to give people a little bit better health care or a little bit better of whatever. That's just, um, it's like a Band-Aid on a broken arm, you know? Uh, does anybody else have a thought on this? That what would you like to see as a, as a, the idea of reparations? I'll I'll jump in. Of when once you start talking uh, reparations, you're instantly dealing with a reaction against it. Of why it wasn't me, I'm not accountable, and. It's a failure to take any kind of community accountability or uh, responsibility for the treaties. <laughs> and the treaties were so one-sided in the first place, uh, it, it just becomes heartbreaking. Um, if you, those who saw uh, Ken Burns' Buffalo series as well, of, of basically what was used to kind of exterminate a species and a way of life by the indigenous people. Uh, how do you even begin to address that? Uh, one way would be to probably do something rather than the nothing we so often do. Um, but uh, uh, it's a challenge uh, to to get any motivation or to to start it going and. It's probably much more the responsibility of us white people who did most of the damage to take the responsibility of, okay, let's come up with something and engaging those that were most harmed to uh, get their opinion of what would be starting points, what would be helpful. Uh, but anyway. That's enough for me. Thank you. <laughs> I see you, Diane, and I'm coming to you next. And Steve, I think you raised some very important points. And while individuals may have not been responsible for specific actions, I think that it would be helpful to acknowledge how you have benefited, even if you were not the executor of acts. Um, how have you benefited? Uh, Diane, Amen. <laughs> Diane, please go ahead and unmute. Well, I was thinking that we could start by um, correcting the textbooks that we use in school to um, bring everyone around to the actual history of the United States, how we treated our people, how we treated the slaves, um, why we had the slaves, how we treated the indigenous people and how we don't belong here. I think that would be a good start. And I don't know of any company that's doing that right now, that's writing the true United States history. Um, I think that, that most of the textbooks are produced in Texas, which is a bad start right there because they're not gonna, Texas is not gonna be proponents of that. So, Diane, the key word that I picked up on in your comments, thank you for sharing those, were truth. Uh, and I see truth and reconciliation uh, were placed in the chat. Um, I, I think that is a very difficult thing, but has the, the ability to be very powerful. Um, but telling the truth is kind of hard. Um, if you'll bear with me, one of, I think maybe my favorite, James Lowen quote, um, the late, great James Lowen, if I can find it in my signature, I want to word it correctly. Telling the truth about the past helps create justice in the present. Achieving justice in the present helps us tell the truth about the past. Um, so I'll put that in the chat in case anyone is interested in rereading or sharing that. Um, do we have others? Janiel, thank you for coming back and joining us. We were just singing your praises in your absence um, and just sharing how grateful we are for your flexibility and jumping on and joining us and sharing such wisdom. So I'm um, so Thanks. glad that you were able to jump back on and thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, my son. 
came home and I had to kind of get him situated, but I have a couple more minutes. So I can can stay for a little bit longer if anyone else has questions. Say no more. I got to run and pick up my daughter from basketball as soon as we're done. So I, I completely get it. Um, do we have other questions or comments or other thoughts that we just want to share with the group and get some feedback? I see that Holly Denning put in the chat, education is key in restorative justice. Absolutely. And and I think different cultures may have different perspectives on criminal justice versus restorative justice. So Janelle, thank you for highlighting that. Um, and for us to remember that if we want to be respectful of people, we have to respect their agency and their autonomy and their ability to make decisions about themselves um, and how they navigate through situations. So I think that was an important point for us to be reminded of. I was always taught by the elders that uh, uh, when it comes to res restorations, um, uh, you don't use the word money. Okay. That's not even in the top 10 wants or needs. That's a, a worldview difference. And that um, what we consider valuable it can't be monetized like in Eurocentric culture, you know. It yeah, I could go on a long time about that and our natural resource. How many of our tribes are situated on lands that are natural resource rich, which has caused all kinds of problems for extraction policies, and it's a it's a worldview difference. And that we don't see that as being rich for the money piece. It's rich in that it provides our people with what they need to live and be well with. Yeah, I think that's so important to highlight. And Janet, I saw your hand. I'm coming to you next. Um, one thing that stood out to me from one of the videos um, was the gentleman that was talking about treaties. And, and he said that his perspective was it was a relationship. It was a relationship to the land, to the water, to the way of life. Um, so just like you were mentioning, the respect for those resources and not a, a first instinct to monetize it. Yeah, definitely a, a different perspective. Janet, go ahead. I'm sorry, I missed what Diane had to say, and I hope I'm not going to repeat her, but it seems to me that... Um, saying using the excuse that well i wasn't there i didn't do it therefore i'm not obligated by what the treaties say is um shallow and self-serving you wouldn't say that if u.s had a treaty with say canada you wouldn't say oh well i didn't do it so um it doesn't apply to me of course it applies to you and it is about relationships as well as land um, and so it, it's easy, it's easy to say, well, that didn't apply to me, I didn't do it. Well, so what, you know? And and, and not only um, is it a, a treaty, a relationship, but it, there's benefit. There's benefits that we got because Columbus came over and did what he did. We have to remember that. I think a lot of the people who think that way had no, um, you know, a, a lot of our, as I mentioned in the chat, our textbooks have whitewashed histories and um, there's this big gap, a generational gap where people were not educated about the the real histories. And I think our children now that are learning real histories, I think we'll see things shift in a better way. Because a lot of times people fear what they don't know or they don't understand. Um, but if you grew up in a generation like my parents did, where you made paper um, feather hats and 
played pilgrims and Indians, you know, in school and you, you have no frame of reference, you're probably not going to have that same respect and awareness as if you, you learned, you know, the devastating true history of what has happened. So I think in a lot of states we are, and I know here in Madison, in the Madison school district, we bring in Ho-Chunk people and <clears throat> people from other tribes and they come into the classroom and educate staff and kids and it's people want to learn. Um, I can't say that for other states, but I think we'll see a shift or I'm hoping, maybe I'm too hopeful that we will see less of that as we learn histories more accurate, accurately as our kids grow up. Well, I'm hopeful with you. Um, one thing that stood out for me for the videos um, when they were talking about no treaties don't expire. Um, and there was one perspective that, and I'm paraphrasing, you wouldn't say that about the constitution. You wouldn't say, oh, it's a hundred, it's hundreds of years old, you know, is it still, is it still intact or still enforceable? Um, so I, I think that sometimes we have a lens of um, being pragmatic and what what works best for us to compromise on or to say, oh, this is a bedrock or has this expired. Um, so just another example of how much perspective matters. Rick, go ahead and unmute, please. Janelle, thank you so much. It's been uh, quite an education. I, I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> so you, you talked about education and I would um, and I would agree that is that is helpful. Do you have would you have any author or authors or book recommendations to learn more about what you advocate for? Second question: Is there is there any um, pending legislation or policy proposals that we should know about that we could contact our elected officials in support of? Um. Yeah, I mean, here in Wisconsin, we advocated for an MMIW office, but we call it MMIW slash R for the R stands for relatives. We refer to um, our own as relatives. So we have advocated for an MMIWR office in Wisconsin to address those issues of our missing and murdered and governor Evers was supportive of, you know, putting a uh, hard funding in for that instead of us relying on trying to write for grants all the time. And um, it was not supported. It was not passed by our legislature in this last budget session. So that was shot down. So if you ever have an opportunity to advocate for us, um, you know, for that to go up again, um, we would love it if people would support that. Um, there are, I'm trying to think if there's anything else i mean the the violence against women act is has to be reauthorized every few years and we always advocate that you know people con contact their us representatives and you know support that being passed cuz that that has the the biggest impact by far um books there are lots of books um I, again, I, I can, I know I have a list, a running list that I recommend to students. Um, I'm trying to think if I even have any sitting out. I mean, there's lots of books on violence, but there's also some really beautiful books on our culture. Um, like one that I have sitting out is Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, sand talk is another one that's out. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's quite a few that are specific to, um, if you want to learn more about the origins of like MMIW or, um, 
um, you know, violence specific, I do have several that I recommend um, that I think would help get more exposure on the topic. So I can compile that and send it to Amy to send out to everyone. I did link, there's a bunch of videos that I think I linked earlier that are earlier up in the, the chat if you want to watch some of these are between 10 and 20 minutes or so um if you want to learn more about that too but yeah perfect um so as we get ready to close uh there is some information that i wanted to put um in the chat there is information at milwaukee public museum on treaties. So that's a link there if you want to learn more about it and then potentially go and visit. Um, there are a few other videos that we did not have time to watch, um, but you may have some interest in. Um, one of them, Broken Treaties, the Oregon Experience, the full documentary, which is about an hour long, is available for free online. Um, the Untold Story of America's, of America's Before Columbus, is um, a, a little lengthy, but but well worth your time. Um, three hours, that's the full series included there. So those are some links if you're interested in. Uh, it is 6.57, so we are gonna shift into our announcements. Um, I have a couple. Uh, this is a busy week for the racial justice program. We open the week off with courageous conversations. On Thursday, we are going to welcome Ms. Beloit. Um, for our Lunch and Learn uh, Pixels and Pageants. She will be talking about her platform. She's very passionate about um, diversity in STEAM and gaming industry. So I'm really looking forward on Thursday at noon to sitting down with our very own Ms. Beloit um, for that talk. And then we also have our Racial Justice Conference, which will be here before you know it. This is our ninth annual Racial Justice Conference. Um, the question we are asking ourselves as our topic this year is, is fear keeping us from eliminating racism? If you haven't already registered, please go ahead and do that. And um, we have wonderful breakouts and keynotes. I'll just do our keynotes briefly. Um, in the morning, we'll hear from Dr. Mark Joseph, who's going to walk us through everyday anti-racism. Um, I'm sure it's a term that we've all heard a lot, but what does that practically mean in our personal lives, in our work lives, as we're moving through our community? I'm so, so excited to have him as our morning keynote and our afternoon keynote. I am thrilled to have Ms. Deborah Watts of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation as our afternoon keynote speaker. She's going to be talking about their family's journey, um, what does justice deferred look like, and then her breakout session in the afternoon um, could not be more excited for. It is a an hour Q&A with Ms. Deborah Watts who many of you may be familiar, um, is a cousin of Emmett Till and his mother, Mamie Till Mobley. Um, so I said, oh, well, well, what do you want the title to be? And I was coming up with all of these things and I'll put, you know, co-founder of the Emmett Till. And she was like, nope. She was like Q&A with Deborah Watts, cousin of Emmett Till. Um, and I said, well, what are the parameters? What do you, and she said, people can ask me anything they would like. Um, so I'm very excited to see where we go with that session. Um, we're also going to have climate justice. We're going to have the League of Women Voters from Beloit and Janesville, and hopefully some legislators join us on a panel um, using civic engagement as a tool to eliminate racism. Um, feel free to stop by our website for the full listing, um, but very excited for this year's lineup. Neil, my friend, what updates do we have for Diversity Action Team? The typical space bar did not work to unmute me. Okay, uh, so I don't have anything specifically for diversity action team or for um, community action. I guess you, do you know anything, Amy? Uh, um, not that I'm aware of, um, and Amy okay. didn't, uh, didn't forward anything, but Okay. If you have questions for community action um, or for DAT, feel free to reach out 
um, to any members of DAT or to give Community Action a call if you have any questions of services that might be under their umbrella. It is 7.01, so I'm going to end the recording. I'd like to add that the NAACP 